Well, I think I want, well, you're going to give me a copy. May 24th, 1983. This is Joe Todd, an interview with Wilma Cabot Bird. I was born October the 10th, 1920. My parents were Ken Cannon Cabot and Mary Rutherford. And they had, my father was from Texas, my mother was from Tennessee. My father made the run with his father. He was just a little boy, two years old at the time. Were you born in Oklahoma City? Yes, I was born at St. Anthony's Hospital in Oklahoma City. Did your father and grandfather talk about the run? Uh, not too much. I wish that I'd gotten more information from my father when he was living. I know that they uh, staked a claim up near Hera, and that my grandfather had a, oh, a Pony Express stop or, or stagecoach mm -hmm. stop or the mail. It was the U.S. mail stop. And he was known as Bud Cavett. Was that his name? And no, it was James Franklin Cavett. He was known as Bud. And uh, they lived in a sod house, I believe. Heard my dad talk about that. And then as time went by, went in con I guess that my grandfather had a sort of hotel along with that mail stop, and he also had a saloon which was uh, uh, which was had made a real influence on my father because he told his own dad he could uh, make him serve the drinks while he was living at home, but afterwards he'd never have another drink of alcohol. Hmm. And what was the name of the saloon? I don't know. I think it was just uh, the Cavett Hotel, maybe. I don't know. We have an old picture upstairs of this. And I think it was Cabot Hotel, and in the window it said, we serve was Schlitz or Budweiser. Hair? Was it in here? I'm not sure. Was this before statehood? And it was after. Hmm. Does that not Well, because in 1907, you know, they had prohibition. Okay, but 1889, they didn't. No, no. Yeah, okay. oh, you mean before statehood. Yeah, before statehood. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, from 1889 to 1907, they did have... And then my, my grandfather uh, lost that hotel and went to, back to Texas, where he was from. When did this happen? I really don't know. Um, uh, my dad went to the grade schools out there around Choctaw, Hera, because I can remember when I was a little girl that we saw his teacher on the street. What kind of work did your grandfather do besides hotel and I think that was just about it. What about your father? My do? father was a trustee he, with the W.T. Hales estate. Uh, he worked for Mr. Hales starting when he was about 19 years old. And uh, he was the personal secretary, I think. They didn't have women secretaries then. My father had gone to a business college here in Oklahoma City. And then he was, uh, uh, maybe he started as bookkeeper, then personal secretary. But then Mr. Hales turned over much of his business planning to my father. What kind of business was it? Uh, Mr. Hales had a, oh, a, I think they were mostly in, uh, no, I don't want to say real estate, but uh, I know that he made his fortune during World War I selling horses and mules first to the Allies before the United States got into the war and then later to the United States Army Cavalry. I have a picture of that upstairs too. Here at Fort Reno? Uh, no, it was right out here in the stockyards. They had big corrals of horses and mules. Interesting. Did you know Mr. Hales? Yes, I did. What was he like? Well, he was a very uh, imposing figure. He was uh, my father's employer, and anything he went, uh, he said went, but he was a very fine man and kind, very kind to 
my parents and to me. Mm-hmm. So that they had, I have two older sisters, and I was uh, coming along as their third child, and I was going to be named William Taylor Cabot after W.T. Hales. So the big surprise was that I was a girl, and so they named me Wilma. But he, uh, he was very proud of the fact that I was his namesake. And I have a letter from him <clears throat> upstairs someplace in my baby book, I think, saying that he was so proud of me. And then he kept on saying that as I progressed through school. And I remember when I made all A's, he would give me, I don't know if it was a dollar for every A or not, but he was just uh, a very nice man. I remember him, good-looking, tall, very rich. (laughs) He had the Hales building downtown. He had the Hales building downtown, and then his home was that big one at 15th and Hudson that has been the Catholic bishop's home. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where did you start to school? Where? Where? Um, at, at Jefferson Grade School. That's here in Oklahoma City? It was. It's, um, it was at the corner of 23rd and Classen, and the Citizen State Bank is on that corner now. Mm-hmm. Who are your teachers? My teachers in kindergarten, Miss Ferguson, and I had Miss Spinning, and uh, Mrs. Day, and uh, oh goodness, there was some lady that I cannot call the name of. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of, uh, not lots, but many of the Oklahoma City people right now went to that grade school. It was, uh, 23rd Street was kind of, it wasn't really the end of Oklahoma City because Putnam Heights was out there then too. Is that the time whenever 23rd was a part of U.S. 66? 39th Street was 66. 39th was 66. I know, though, that we came in from out of town to the Capitol. Mm -hmm. Maybe we did turn on 23rd Street. Well, someone told me at one time that 23rd was called the Broadway of America. Well, that could have been, but I've forgotten that. It wasn't a very busy street mm-hmm. because I I remember going to play at a house there on 23rd Street. Had a playmate. Mm-hmm. How big was Oklahoma City at that time? Oh goodness, I don't know. There were mm-hmm. three high schools: Classen and Central and Capitol Hill. Probably less than a hundred thousand. Maybe not that much. Which high school did you go to? Classen. Classen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I graduated from there in 1937, and two of my children graduated from there, and one of them attended school there. Well, two, the other two, both of them attended school there. They didn't graduate. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me what it was like to be a child in the Depression? During the Depression, and my father was working for Mr. Hales, so he had a good job, and Mr. Hales uh, had a lot of money. And uh, we did not suffer financially in our home. I can remember uh, my mother would take us down to see the soup lines, and that would have probably been down by the river where the tent cities were, and uh, that made a big impression on us, and she did that so that we would know what was going on, and not to feel so lucky ourselves, but to have empathy Mm -hmm. for people who had much less. Who sponsored those soup lines? I don't know. It could have been uh, churches. I think it was sort of a volunteer thing. Mm -hmm. St. Anthony's Hospital had one, too. I remember that, going and looking at the back. As a matter of fact, St. Anthony's Hospital had a soup line for a long time. 
I guess they still, they don't now, but I can remember taking my own children mm -hmm. to see the men standing in the soup line at St. Anthony's in the 50s. Some of the churches still have. Meals on wheels, uh, that's though not that's not for the indigent, is it? You know more about that than I do. No, uh, I know St. Paul's has, though, because every Sunday there is normally five or six people up there at St. Paul's. Our church, First Baptist, has a separate mission called the Good Shepherd Ministry, and they will feed people who are hungry. We take cans of food down there. Mm -hmm. At least they're supposed to. I usually forget yeah. every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Where'd you meet your husband? Where? Mm -hmm. Here in Oklahoma City. I graduated from class and then went away to college, which shows you that we were not so bad off. Where'd you go to college? At Sweetbriar College in Virginia. But my, uh, at that point, Mr. Hales had died. I think the summer of 37 he died, and in his will, he provided for the education for all the Cavett girls. He had already paid tuition for my two older sisters, and they'd gone out of state too, which was sort of the thing to do then if people could afford it, to go east to school, to get contact with people outside of this little narrow provincial place of Oklahoma City. What kind of school was Sweetbriar? Sweetbriar was a very fine academic women's college and still is. Uh, you've heard of the big seven of Astor, Wellesley, Smith. Well, Sweetbriar being in Virginia couldn't be in those Ivy League schools because they were all up on, in New England. But it was called the Vassar of the South, is referred to. It was a very hard school to get into. I graduated with very high grades from Classen, and uh, I, that uh, the scholarship thing was no problem to me, and Mr. Hales had provided the finances, so I was a very lucky young woman. And that school did bring me contact with people from New York, Massachusetts, Virginia, Texas, I still have friends that I can visit, and once in a while we get together. I haven't been back to a reunion at Sweetbriar since 1961, but I, and I planned to go two years ago, and they had it while I was still teaching, so I couldn't go. What was the curriculum at Sweetbriar? Curriculum then was mostly liberal arts subjects. Like I majored in Latin and minored in Greek, Lots of foreign language, lots of history. Uh, the oh, foreign affairs or current current affairs courses were being given then, and economics. And but at that time, I wasn't too interested in that because my plans didn't include ever being in business. Right? <laughs> All I was thought about was getting married, as most of the young women did then. Our goal was to go away to cut to school, and then I ended up at University of Oklahoma to be in a sorority, Which to one? make friends. I was a Kappa Alpha Theta, and uh, to find some promising young man, and uh, to raise a family. That was just about as far as my thoughts went at that time. Is that when you met your husband? Yes. I was not. I, I was home for Christmas vacation, while I was still attending Sweetbriar. And it was um, oh goodness, I don't know what year. Thirty nine. That doesn't matter. But he was already out of school, and he was working for the National Youth Administration. It was a program that had been set up under the Roosevelt Recovery Act or the recovery program, so that young people would be provided with jobs. What did your husband do for him? He was the assistant state director, and he traveled all around the state, seeing that uh, they were building the walls or laying the sidewalks or, or doing these work projects, like the WPA was for older men and the NYA 
was for younger people. Did they have similar projects? But they had similar projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was your husband's full name? John Philip Bird. And his father was Homer Virgil Bird, who was on the Board of Affairs early in the statehood of Oklahoma. At the time of his death in the 50s, Mr. Bird was with the Internal Revenue Service, but his name is on a lot of plaques on buildings throughout the state, or maybe they've torn those buildings down, I don't know, but it used to be. The Board of Affairs. Mm -hmm. hmm. When did you get married? When? Yeah. We were married December the 25th, 1940. Our Phil had already graduated from OSU, as I said, and he was working for NYA. But in the spring of 40, with the war situation shaping up in Europe, the reserve officers were called to active duty. Lots of them were. And Phil, being a very yet recent graduate, was called up. And uh, he was sent to a post in Texas, although he spent some time at a post in Virginia. Fort Eustis? I believe that might have been it. It was Fort Eustis, Fort Belvoir, and Fort Myer. Right? Fort Myer. Fort Myer. It was Fort Myer. Just out of D.C. Yes. Okay. And he went there for some kind of a school. <clears throat> but he was gone during that fall before we were married in December. Mm -hmm. And I was finishing up my work at OU in a hurry. I went to summer school that summer so that I could uh, finish my degree in that first semester, and we were married Christmas Day. What was your major at OU? Latin. Latin. Mm-hmm. Then and later I became a Latin teacher. Didn't intend to when I was majoring in Latin. It was just something to do, as I said. And you graduated in 1940? 1941. 1941. I finished my work up in 40, but you know they don't award uh, degrees until commencement in the spring. So I received my degree in 1941. Mm -hmm. Ever go to the Texas OU football game? Oh, yes. We used to go every year. I went, I can remember going before when I was uh, a student at OU. My parents loved football. Mm -hmm. And I can remember going down there on a weekend with Phil. Uh, they were the chaperones. And he stayed with a friend, and I stayed with my sweetwater college friend who attended the University of Texas at that time. Sure, I, I could go clear back on those OU football games. It makes me mad I don't get tickets now. We married 1940, December, married Christmas Day. Mm-hmm, December 25th. Then he was sent to... Uh, I guess that's where he was stationed. He was a reserve officer? He was a reserve officer on active duty, and his post was with the 69th Coast Artillery at Camp Hewlin, a temporary post down near Palacios, Texas, mm -hmm. close to the Gulf. And I lived in a little town called Bay City, Texas, just for, oh, four or five months about 30 miles from the camp and we didn't like that situation he had to commute he would get a ride with other officers so they at first somehow they said that people who wanted transfers could apply for orders and he came home and showed me that the orders could be to Hawaii or I'd just kind of forgot, maybe the Philippines or something, but the only one that sounded good at all was Hawaii. So he put in for that transfer, and he was a friend, a very good friend of Senator Elmer Thomas. That's how Phil had really gotten that post with the National Youth Administration. So Senator Thomas was influential in getting that assignment and we received orders for Hawaii in about May of 1941. 
which started us on our way. Were you excited about going to Hawaii? I was very excited about it, but yet there was some kind of a fear in the back of my mind. Uh, I was very, very conscious of that war, of the war in Europe. My good friend from Sweetbriar, who, who lived in Austin, and I'd met her at OU T Texas Games, had been on that ship, the Athenia. You know what I'm talking about? It was the first passenger liner, maybe the only one, sunk by the German submarines. So this really brought that war home to me early, and I believe that happened. When was that ship sunk? Uh, they were coming from England to New York, and it was uh, sunk not too far away from the British Isles because they were in lifeboats and were taken to Ireland. Mm -hmm. North Sea, I guess. I'm not, my geography's bad. Anyway, Did she ever talk about that, about being on board that ship? Oh, yeah. And what happened? Yeah. What'd she say about it? Well, they were having dinner, and she said that all of a sudden, uh, without warning, the table started sliding. And uh, then maybe they told them all to return to their cabins and, and get their purses or something and, and to meet up on deck. They had a few minutes. It wasn't just like, boom, down the ship goes. So she was. Uh, she went back and got her things together, and uh, they went down a ladder to get into the lifeboat. And I remember saying that she threw her purse into the ocean to lighten the load, and that when she was in the lifeboat, they were, uh, there were, I don't know how many people in it, but they were taking in water, and they were bailing out with their shoes. And then they were rescued by a, oh, some kind of a, maybe Norwegian ship. I don't know if it would have been Norwegian, or, but anyway, some kind of a foreign ship, not an American ship, a tanker of some kind. And then they took them to the port in Ireland. How come the Germans sunk the Athenian? Well, they had uh, been at war for how long then? This would, had to have happened in about 1939, the fall of 39, I believe. Okay, the war started uh, September of 39 is when the war started. Okay, well then they they uh, they did that to that ship just right away because okay. they were coming home. Because it's September 1st. It was happened. Labor Day. It was Labor Day when okay. that happened. Hitler invaded Poland September 1st, 1939. Okay, well then they got busy and sank a ship, I guess, just to let everybody know they meant business. Mm -hmm. And certainly scared my friend to death. Mm -hmm. I can see why. Mm -hmm. So they were, uh, they, did, they were safe, and there weren't too many people lost on that ship, I, as I remember. Mm -hmm. Now, when you went to Hawaii, of course, I'm sure you traveled by train to the West Coast. From no, we didn't. You didn't? We drove. Oh. Okay. Um, we came from Texas up to Oklahoma City to say goodbye to our families. And I started to say I had a little fear in my heart. I can remember telling my friends I was going to Hawaii to get bombed. And didn't mean, you know, now we talk about getting bombed. It's just something else. But we meant bombs dropping on the islands. But anyway, I really, I halfway was, jo I was probably joking, but on the other hand, there was a real fear. And it was a long way over there. You couldn't get on a plane and fly over in a few hours. We got on the uh, transport ship in San Francisco, and we were on the, it was a little tiny boat, a little tiny boat, a little transport, the San Mihal, San Mihal. I think that it's still going. It was an old boat then, and it took us 10 days. And my husband was seasick almost all the way. Did you have any fear thinking of your friend on the Athenia? I don't think that, no, because we were clear across the world from that war. That war was so far away, and we were going to Hawaii. But you see, the Japanese-American relations were not too good then. Uh, I can't tell you all the history about it. I was, I've been reading a few things, but 
uh, they negotiated quite a, quite a while. And finally those negotiations broke down. But we were on the, that uh, transport and I became friends with another girl from Oklahoma and a, and a man from Oklahoma. Well, he wasn't on the, on the boat. There were about three or four of us from Oklahoma. Uh, Ruth Clark from Tulsa and June Rutland from Oklahoma City. Her name was June Atkinson and uh, a girl from Muskogee, Jane Schaller. Her maiden name had been Jane Fight. And there, there were about four of us from Oklahoma, four women. And they, they were married. Their husbands were not on the, the boat. Phil was on the boat. Their husbands had gotten uh, to go on one of the Matson liners, just extra passengers, and they had had a marvelous, luxurious cruise over. <laughs> and these women were with us on this funny little boat. But we, uh, we played bridge, and we had dances at night, and the, uh, there were enlisted men. It was a troop ship. Uh, we're on the boat down below. We were on the upper deck, and uh, they had an orchestra. The enlisted men did. So they'd play, and we'd sing and dance and tried to make it a cruise ship, <laughs> but it really wasn't. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, anyway, when we got there, uh, it was very thrilling. It was like going from one world to another world. It was like waking up that next morning in heaven because the birds were singing and the, the odor, the wonderful scent, scent's better, of flowers, perfumey smells, birds, calm, we were, uh, we got a room, I think they'd gotten it for us. Uh, no, as soon as we got there, they had a housing place set up, or, you know, where can you stay? We're, we'll find a place for you to stay. And we stayed right across from the uh, Moana Hotel. The Moana's still standing. Is that in Honolulu? That's in Honolulu. It's in the Waikiki Beach area. So it was just dreamy. And uh, we stayed there for maybe three or four days and then realized we couldn't afford to stay there. So we started looking for an apartment. And we found one. It was a small studio apartment over about six blocks from the beach at Waikiki. We could walk over there easily in our swimming suits. And, uh, and what? What's going to say? And it was still like being, it was like being on a honeymoon. We'd just been married six months at that point. So we, oh, and I just ran across the, the amount of rent that we paid for that. It was $55 a month. And our car was on the way. They, the Army would send cars and all of our belongings and everything. I was going to ask if you got to take all of your things with mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. they, Army packers came to our little garage apartment at Bay City, Texas, and packed us up. I didn't have much. I remember they even packed the groceries. <laughs> you know, the cinnamon and the salt and that stuff. And we went over there uh, with very little, very little extra stuff, really. So then we uh, rented a furnished apartment. And then later on, we lived in a furnished house up in Upper Manoa Valley. So, what's the next question? What was your husband's job? Oh, okay. He was assigned to the 64th Coast Artillery in the Anti-Aircraft Division. And he was, was stationed at Fort Shafter. Fort Shafter. What was his rank? He was a, a second lieutenant then. He received a promotion as soon as we got to Honolulu. He, that was a nice thing that he got to be a first lieutenant, so we had a little bit more money coming in, not much. But his the mission of their of Fort Shafter, it's above Pearl Harbor by about oh five, maybe ten miles, but maybe not that far. 
I'm not good on this, but their, the mission was to defend Pearl Harbor against air enemy attack. So we had a nice time there for about four months. Uh, Phil was, they went on maneuvers a lot. Uh, maneuvers meaning, you know, play like war games. And we used to go out and watch them, uh, watch, Phil was assigned to a battery. And I don't believe he was, I don't know if he was assistant gunnery officer or not, but anyway, yeah, they would fire. So it was fun to watch his battery fire at the uh, at the target. The target would be a, a long sleeve pulled by a plane. Then they'd see how many hits they could get and see which battery could do the best, too. Competition thing. So I can remember doing that a couple of times. But the... Uh, uh, the seventh came, and we had decided to sleep late that morning. So, mm -hmm. because uh, the weekend before, Phil had been on a sabotage alert, uh, sabotage against the Japanese maybe destroying any of the, I mean, we're talking about Japanese spies, mm -hmm. contaminating water, maybe fooling with any of the defense Electric, I don't know, but anyway, it was a sabotage alert, and they all had to stay in their positions on the field to move out away from the post. And then on that Friday night, December the 5th, there had been a reception for General Short, who had received orders to return to the States. Hawaii was a territory then, yeah. not considered one of the United States. So I had the privilege of meeting him and Mrs. Short, and Mrs. Short was an Oklahoma City girl. Her name was Isabel Dean, and her father had been mayor of Oklahoma City in the early days. What was he like, General Short? I just remember him as being a, a very nice man. I couldn't tell you. I know that people thought that time that he was doing a very good job and that he was treated very unfairly that they had to have that the United States had to have somebody to blame and so they blamed General Short and Admiral Kimmel who was in charge who was the common commanding officer of the Navy but they were very well respected in Hawaii by the military and by the civilians Anyway, back to seven, we were sleeping late. Now you're at Fort Sharp? No, we're living in a, an apartment on the Alawai Canal, six blocks from the beach at Waikiki. A very beautiful place. And how far is that from Pearl Harbor? About 10 miles. So we received a telephone call at about eight o'clock from one of my friends who, was, who had family in Hawaii. I had met her when we were stationed at Camp Hewlin, and her uh, she was visiting her family. Her husband was on the mainland. He was stationed at some camp in California, 
and she called and her question was, hello Wilma, is it true that the Japanese are attacking Pearl Harbor? And I said, what? And she repeated, I said, well, wait just a minute. Uh, I'll call you back. So I said this to Phil, and he called out to the post and got his sergeant in his battery. And he said, is it true that the Japanese are attacking Pearl Harbor? The sergeant said, yes, sir, it sure is, and you better get out here as fast as you can. Only he used a lot stronger language than that. <laughs> and, I can, and I wouldn't repeat that. Anyway, we were out of there in about five minutes' time. I mean, Phil said, we've got to get out of here. And I remember having my hair rolled up in bobby pins, which was a, a thing with all of the girls in. And I had to leave without taking the bobby pins off. And, to, and he took me to my friend's house. She said, uh, come over here. Now, where did she live? She lived a little farther away from the beach area. Um, it was right on the way from our point of residence to his army post. His army post was between Honolulu and Pearl Harbor. And I'd say that our apartment was 10 miles from Pearl Harbor, and his post was probably three, maybe not even that. Anyway, uh, when I got to the Bettelson's house, before that, I'm going to back up. When we got outside of the apartment, we looked up in the sky and saw an airplane. And Phil said, do you see the rising sun on the tips of that plane? And I looked and I said, yes. So we immediately got into the car and we hung out and thought, what is going on? So he took me quickly to the place of, at where Val lived and told me goodbye. And I remembered... Uh, thinking after he left that may be the last time I see him because it was a terrifying thing Japanese were attacking Pearl Harbor what, what are they going to do here oh, it was just a numb stupefied uh, just complete shock we were in shock I would say, I would say that, was, that would probably be the best description I was in shock. We, um, it seemed unreal. There were lots of noises, bombs and explosions. And uh, I got into the Bettelson house, and I did, they had been up early. That's how they had heard all of this. And, but nothing on the radio. Now, how do you suppose they knew? Why did she ask that question? Maybe they'd seen planes with with wings on, with a uh, rising sun on them. Anyway, we uh, huddled around there in that living room, uh, talking. And Val had two little children, so it occurred to me, and I'm sure to them too, that we shouldn't act all that scared to death. And turned on the radio. So pretty soon, I guess this had to be about ten o'clock. The governor of Hawaii came on the radio and announced that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor and that a state, we were in a state of war, and he urged all the citizens of Hawaii to, became, to remain calm and to do what they could for their country. I remember his, when he said to remain calm, he was just, his voice was not any more calm, and it didn't give me any assurance that everything was okay. What time was this? That was about 10 a.m., I think. And then he said, we're going off the air now. There will be no more radio communication until further notice. That was out. No connection was at what was going on. We, um, I thought their house was right next door to a church. Central Union Church. And Phil and I had been there, oh, maybe two or three times. It's a lovely church, and we didn't, it, that was not our practice. But at home, it was certainly my practice to go to church every Sunday. So I thought, well, that's the best place to go. I must get over there to that church. 
So I got uh, myself all ready and told them I was going to church, as usual. <laughs> you know. So I got over there, and there was about a handful of people there. I'd say there were ten, and uh, nobody saying very much. Everybody's crying, and I sat down at the front, you know, toward the front, and waited. And while I was waiting, I was looking through the hymnal at the back because it's at the back of most church hymnals, they have uh, passages from the Bible, selected passages that are that have verses of reassurance. And uh, when he came in, the minister, he was, it was not the regular minister, it was an assistant minister, he just looked at us and said that we'd all better go home. It's a Jap that we were in a state of war and that the Japanese might come back and that we'd all better be in, in shelter and certainly off the street. I was trying to remember that, that verse. I had written it down. It's out of Psalms. Here it is. I remember this, and I've, and I've uh, had it circled in my Bible. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? I like that. It's the Lord really speaking to me. And I went home feeling better that I'd been there. But I thought after I got outside, well, we didn't pray or sing or anything. It was just sort of a funny little incident. Well, anyway, we got back home, and then people were busy at that house. They were trying to fix lunch. Uh, the Bettelsons did have a maid, a Japanese maid. And we were trying to figure out what we'd have for about 10 people. Uh, their family, me, a friend of the brothers. So we had uh, pork and beans and biscuits. I remember that very well. And we were very hungry and we ate it. Uh, afterwards, Phil appeared. I didn't think he was gonna, I was gonna see him again. And he came back with the Colonel's wife and her mother, uh, not from the post, but one of the colonels in his regiment had just arrived and they couldn't get quarters on the post. It was hard to do then because the army was forming and they couldn't quarter everybody on those posts. So during the afternoon, we got ready for the night. Uh, I think Phil came and said that we were supposed to have curfew, nobody on the streets, and that we were going to have to black out everything by night. And then... We had extras. The Honolulu paper put out extras, and maybe they were yelling extras out on the street. And then all of this was being said, civilians ordered off the street, and uh, stay in your houses, and no lights tonight. And, and there was, you see, Hawaii had a large Japanese population. It still does. And uh, they certainly outnumbered the Haole, the white people. And the Japanese were Americans just like us, but suddenly there was a lot of suspicion, and so they were going to keep everybody off the streets and shoot anybody who was out there. So that was enough to keep everybody home. So that night we all got ready for bed. How long did the talk last? <clears throat> you know, I was trying to remember to recall. Have you seen Tora, 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 that mm -hmm. movie? I have two, and I cannot remember. All I can say is that that there were bombs or explosions going on all during that day. You could hear them. Uh huh. Navy shells. Uh, I think our own Navy shells were firing and uh, missing, and shells were landing like a school not too far from where Phil and I lived down in that Waikiki area was hit by one of our own shells, I think. See, we couldn't get much information about anything. No one knew, really. But the next time I saw that school, it had a big hole in it. Not completely smashed, but it had been hit. I'd say probably, I think the account says that they were all gone by noon. That the first wave of planes came over, and then they went back, and then a second wave came back. 
and they strafed, you know, the seals and and did what damage they could, but I think they were all gone by about noon. But we thought they were coming back. And then there were rumors that parachutists were, had landed and that uh, they were going to do a, a beach landing. And so it was very frightening. So we had our, our, our main, we had one room curtained off downstairs. It was a very large room, we were sleeping upstairs. Room curtained off and uh, a radio in there to receive shortwave messages and we could get the police report. And this is where we were hearing all of this about parachutists landing up in the valleys and and uh, the, I don't know, just awful rumors, you know. A man had been seen cutting wires and all this kind of stuff. So after that, uh, maybe about 10 or 11 o'clock, I said, well, I think we all ought to go to bed. We had these two young children. My friend and I were going to share the room with the children. It was a huge bedroom. There were two beds, two, two children's cribs. So we went to bed as usual, but the only thing that was unusual is that I had a knife under my pillow because I thought, well, if they come in here, we'll, I'll give them a pretty good fight. <laughs> That, that, of course, is ridiculous, but at the time, you're not thinking clearly. So the weather that night it was another factor that I think was answer to prayer. A cloud cover came over, and you couldn't see the moon. So all I could think of was, well, it, the Japanese planes couldn't see us either. And uh, about in the middle of the night, maybe 2 or 3 o'clock, I didn't sleep or wink that whole night. They came up to tell us to get downstairs with the children, that the Japanese were coming back. They had just heard this on the radio. So we got up, and I, I carried the younger child. She must have been about two, and I was not used to carrying babies or children, and I thought I was not going to make it, but I did. So we sat down there, I guess, for an hour, maybe not that, and then went back upstairs and lay down, and, of course, wide awake, and the next morning I realized I'd never gone to sleep. I think that's the only time in my life I never did sleep that night and just kept functioning beautifully. I wasn't tired the next day. The second day we had we listened to Roosevelt's message to autonomy. I believe that was December the 8th. And he uh, asked for the declaration of war and announced it. Then... Uh, Bill called to say that Mrs. Short had contacted, or she had contacted my parents, that she had gotten to make a telephone call to Oklahoma City. Now, telephones at that point over there, I think they were shortwave radio, too, messages, because then you had to be quiet and listen to what somebody was saying back to you, even though you were on the telephone. And I was, of course, very concerned about my family, and I wondered what in the world they were thinking. They didn't know what was going on. I knew I was safe, and I knew Phil was safe, but I knew they didn't know it. So sure enough, she had had been allowed to make that call, and Phil had seen her. The gentleman short-lived on, on the post at Fort Shafter, and they had evacuated all of those women up to a tunnel, actually on the post, but it was an ammunition storage place. So Phil had gone in there, I don't know, to see about something, and he'd seen Mrs. Short and had asked her to give the message to the deans that he and I were all right, his parents were at Church City. So then I stayed with the Vettelsons most of that week. Don't remember too much about it. We were busy trying to get supplies, flashlights, uh, more water kettles. We did I say that we drew lots of water that day because we thought the water supply was going to be poisoned. So we were just, and then we went back to my apartment and got what food I had. And I saw Bob Vettel some years later, and he said, I remember that we got a can of rattlesnake meat from your house. <laughs> of course, that's a Japanese delicacy. So I had probably bought it at some little grocery just for a kick. I wasn't about to eat it. Anyway, when we finally got back to... Uh, to our apartment and got kind of settled in and things kind of calmed down after about a week. 
Uh, then we tried to pick up the pieces, and we were trying to figure out what we were going to do. And we heard that the Army was immediately evacuating all of the women and children. We were going to see that they got back to the United States. So sure enough, I received a call to volunteer for the first convoy. And I said, no, I didn't want to do that, but I was going to try to stay with Phil as long as he would be there. And I set out to do just that. And the way, only way you could do it would be to get some essential military job, something that they couldn't do without. So I applied first. I remember going down to the post office in Honolulu. They were asking for censors because they, they started censoring all the mail coming into Hawaii and all the mail leaving Hawaii. And I wrote down that I had some knowledge of French. And I don't know if that would have helped them or not, but anyway, I thought that was a pretty good recommendation. that I understood French, and uh, therefore I could do the censorship job. Well, Phil found out about this new organization that they were forming. It was called the Women's Air Raid Defense. And they were organizing it in order to relieve servicemen for more important jobs, like, uh, like uh, holding guns. And their job at that time was to man a plotting board. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? It re received reports from radar stations around the island, and they'd uh, give a code number, and then we'd push a little arrow out onto a board that by graph, it was all suction, and we could get a good picture of the flights that were coming in and, and leaving Honolulu. So we, uh, we started training for that. I was uh, okayed. I had to give all my family history, and physical and everything else. And we started in training sessions at Iolani Palace, that's the main government building in Honolulu, and our instructors were Signal Corps officers, Army Signal Corps. After about two weeks, we moved to Fort Shafter. They moved all these women. There must have been about 80 of us into a newly built non-commissioned officer's quarters on Fort Shafter. We were issued helmets, gas masks, and we ordered our uniforms. We rode to work in an army truck because the, the place where we worked was top secret. It was in an old ramshackle building that no one would ever think was an important house. And we had to walk through muck and mire and everything else to get there, and sure enough, it rained and rained that night. I can remember getting galoshes, and they'd just be covered with red and mud. Anyway, we did that, and uh, after a, a couple of months, or a month maybe, uh, they renovated the tunnel up at uh, Shafter, the one where the women had been taken, the ambulance the ammunition storage place, and they'd air-conditioned it and moved all the equipment up there. This was an information center for the Army, Navy, Marines, and had all these people around and watched us do these little uh, flights on a board. Um, we felt a lot safer there. We uh, started having a more structured type of life. We didn't have to get in that army truck and ride down to that old building. We could walk up the hill to the tunnel. And we had four shifts of six hours on duty, and we rotated those shifts so that some, some group of women was always on that board. And then the interesting thing is that I was on the shift from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. the night of the Battle of Midway. That was in June, June 4th, 1942. And we spotted the B-17s back to Hickam Theater. And that was quite a thrill to watch those arrows forming. That meant the planes were coming back and that there was, that they were going to be safe because their danger had been running out of gas tanks. 
Did you see Pearl Harbor after the attack? Did you go there? No, not for some time. Um, you couldn't get in. I mean, you couldn't just go out there and drive through. But my friends who lived out on the other side of the island, they had been evacuated from Schofield Barracks into schools in Honolulu the night of the 7th. And they had all these women herded on buses. And they were able to see Pearl Harbor from afar and could see all those ships in flames. Just burning light, and the night was just, the, light, the sky was lighted up. They said it was a terrible, terrible sight. And one of, uh, that was one of the girls was from Oklahoma. I guess all three of those girls were on that class. Yes, they were evacuated into the schools in Honolulu, and then later two of them uh, joined this women's air raid defense along with me because they also wanted to stay over there. The third girl had to come home. She was pregnant, and of course they wouldn't let her stay. They couldn't do a job, and they didn't want to be responsible. The whole thing, the Army didn't want to be responsible for the wives and children of these men, and they thought the men would be a lot better off without the responsibility themselves. So, uh, where are we now? Do you want me to keep talking or you want to talk? No, go ahead. At the end of October, that was 1942 now, mm -hmm. I received maternity leave to have my first child, Ann Carroll, who was born on March the 10th, 1943. I promised the Army that I would return to duty when she was old enough to leave in a nursery. And that was how I got to stay and stay over there and have the baby. But uh, when she was about a year old, I found, a, no, she was a little over a year old. Phil was born exactly two years later. I found out I was going to have a second child. Then I was really scared that they were going to ship me back. In the meantime, my parents, all through this, never did understand why. I wouldn't come home. I guess at the first. They thought I'd be a lot safer at home, and they didn't know why I wanted to be in that dangerous position. But as long, And Phil had been transferred out of that gun battery. I think the 64th Coast Artillery left the island. Some, I know they did, sometime during the war. But Phil had uh, gotten a job on, the, on General Richardson's staff. General Robert C. Richardson was com uh, commander-in-chief. He relieved, no, I don't, I, I think he did relieve Phil. But he was the head man in the Army all during World War II in the Hawaiian Islands. Why did they relieve him, of course? Because he was tried, wasn't he? See, the time has gone so far. Yeah. I thought that they were going to try him. They were going to try Short and Kimmel. I'm not sure on that. But they were brought, they were relieved of duty as soon as they could find somebody. Nimitz, Admiral Nimitz, relieved Kimmel. Richardson relieved Short. They were going to stand trial for the responsibility of Pearl Harbor, I guess. But anyway, uh, Phil had gotten this job where he was in the intelligence section. And among other duties, he was in charge of a visitor's bureau. And he met many of the famous people who came through the island. The USO entertainers like Bob Hope, Jack Benny, those, some of the women I can't remember. But he also got to meet, or he was in the presence of President Roosevelt. And he came over to confer with General MacArthur. They met there during the war, or toward the latter part. After after MacArthur had, no, MacArthur was in Australia or someplace down in the South Pacific, and he flew up to meet Roosevelt. Phil uh, was assigned, I think, as aide to General MacArthur while he was there. But we were, uh, and we were living way up in Honolulu in the mountainous area and had a wonderful view of the ocean. You could look out and see 
all of the ships that ever came in. And one of the most uh, thrilling things uh, that I remember was to see the task forces and how they grew from just nothing. And then we'd have carriers and battleships, destroyers coming in the Pearl. And of course, none of this was ever in the paper or on the radio. And we couldn't write it home in letters. Our mail was in. We couldn't take pictures of it. It was, it was just totally top secret stuff that I got to be in on. And uh, it's been so long ago that I see I've forgotten all lots of details. But I can remember. I, what exactly were you doing on the raid? Air raid defense. Air raid defense. Mm -hmm. Uh, we sat at little, we had a great big plotting board, and I was, uh, each one of us sat at a station, a radio station, I guess, receiving uh, radar reports from a man out in the field. We had on headsets, and we could sit there all six hours and maybe not get one thing. We just sat there. Somebody said, or had posed the question, well, surely we were relieved from time to time. And I believe we were. I think they had two or three girls who would come around and take your headsets and let you get up and go get a cup of coffee or stretch or something. Because six hours is a long time to be on duty. I'm sure we had that had to happen. But we were just hooked up, and then he'd come over with a code, and he'd say, rascal. They called us. And then we'd say, uh, Roger Oscar, or something like that, or yes, Oscar. Out in the field, he was Oscar and I was Rascal. And then he'd just give me a reading, like 5284. Go five that way, two up here, maybe. I don't know. It was just like a graph. So that's what we did. It was the same thing that they had been doing before we took over. And then, if you were very good at this, you got to become a supervisor. And I got to become a supervisor, where I walked around the table to be sure that everybody was doing this right. And then also, I got to identify the flight. Like when we had a series of arrows, we knew that there was a plane flight coming in, right? So the Marine Corps is sitting up there, and the Army and the Navy are sitting up there. There's no separate Air Force. It's just Marine, Army, Navy. So then they'd get busy and find out if that was their flight. And if it was, they would call down to the supervisor and say, it is uh, it, uh, Marine or Army. And then we'd pull off this thing and put a big flag up. If we, they couldn't identify it, they would put, I don't know if they put enemy, but they'd send up their fighter planes just like that to find out what their plane was or what they were doing up there. So that's kind of what it consisted of. It's hard to explain. Now, I'm just about come to the end of all of my notes. Did you pull any guard duty? And I have sentry, one. sentry duty. Oh, no, no. This was all just doing the uh, plotting board. 